from Liger Partners coming, oh, and now I'm live. So welcome to the jungle. I'm Eric Holtzclaw from Liger Partners uh, coming to you live from my basement. <laughs> and we're talking today with Fred, Cost Fred Costalucci with the Costalucci Group. So thanks so much for joining us this afternoon, Fred. Thanks for having me, appreciate it. And and I am so excited. I'm in the home, I'm in the home office. So You're in the home office, yes, yeah. Yours has a little bit. I has have an or in the background. This is the first time I've used this on any of the Zoom meetings or anything that I've been doing. So people have seen a little bit of all of my house, I think, throughout this process. So um, one of the reasons I wanted to have Fred on in particular is, uh, you know, tell us first a little bit about who the Castellucci Group is, and then we'll kind of get into that. Yeah, certainly. So we're a collection of restaurants here in Atlanta. So we have the Iberian Pig, two locations, Decatur and Buckhead. We also have Sugo out in Johns Creek. We have Double Zero in Decatur as well. Two restaurants at Crog Street Market, Bar Mercado and Recess. And then we also have Cooks and Soldiers in West Midtown. Yeah, so not a big, big group of restaurants for kind of what's going on now in the current situation. So and it's been wild. Yeah. So, I mean, take me back. I want to talk about what you've been doing from a pivot perspective, but as this all started to unfold and you know, you have all these restaurants and you have all this staff, like how did you guys start to decide what you were going to do next and, and kind of roll with this? Yeah. I mean, so we have 65 managers and uh, 350 uh, employees total. And so uh, really where this began was kind of end of February and I started talking to friends that, you know, had restaurants in Seattle or in the industry in New York. And I started seeing kind of the beginnings of what could happen and how and how bad it, it could ultimately be. And and I will say I had a, a guest that was in Iberian Pig Buckhead that I was talking to who's an executive at Coca-Cola and based in Japan. And he was telling me, he's like, you have no idea how bad this is. He's like, the, the data that's coming out of China is completely false. And the, the, this is way worse than anyone can even imagine. Wow. And so he scared the living SHIT out of me. And so I, uh, I kind of took that information with the information that was going on uh, and, you know, specifically Seattle and New York and said, we we really need to have a plan on how this could unfold. And so the first thing we did was kind of like the contingency plan, which was sign up all the restaurants on Uber Eats. So yeah, okay. that's like a, a three week lead time. So by the time we actually launched on Uber Eats, it was the Monday that basically everything disappeared, everything shut down. So, you know, that was kind of like an early lifeline for us. But you know, in those in those first early days, you know, everything was nothing but just bad news after bad news after bad news, especially for restaurants. It's like, you know, first you're like, well, dining rooms, there's got to be social distancing. So we're spacing the tables out. We're doing all these safety precautions. And, you know, we're trying to operate, you know, within the confines of the normal business. And pretty quickly, you know, as these kind of stay at home orders had been, you uh, you know, pretty much come down in different states and municipalities all over the U.S., we realized that Atlanta wasn't far behind and that we really would have to transition to this takeout delivery environment quickly because there wasn't going to be an option to have people in our dining rooms. And so when we saw that happen, that's honestly where the, the big inflection point came was when the mayor told all the dining, all the restaurants they had to close uh, and become yeah. take out delivery. And also at that time, a lot of the customers didn't really know what to do. Like, can we go to restaurants? Can we pick up takeout? What, like yeah. there was no sense of like, what's okay to do and what's not. And so those early days were super scary because, you know, our sales are down 70, 80, 90%, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And I think a lot of operators looked at that and said, you know what, there's no way we could, we can, you know, weather this storm because, you know, you take, you know, it's, a, it's not a high margin business to begin with. And so you right. take 80, 90% of your sales away. There's just, you know, most people, you know, aren't going to be able to see a way out of that. And, you know, and, and a lot of restaurants don't have, you know, capital on hand for um, disasters such as this. And, you know, we, I took a step back and I said, look, you know, what, this is affecting everybody equally. So the, the playing field is the same for everybody. Everybody's facing the same challenge. So where can we think creatively about um, this, 
you know, I'm not going to call it an opportunity, but this crisis to say pivot in your business model, like it's like, yeah, I mean, what, I mean, what can we do here? And so, you know, I was my, my number one goal from day one and to now is to make sure that our managers are employed. Like we, we don't have a company without the managers. Um, Like I can't, you know, restart every one of these restaurants without our management teams. And so if I don't have them on board, then, you know, we, you know, even, you know, you furlough them or lay them off. There's just no telling that you'll be able to come back from that and that you'll be able to open those restaurants and op- reopening these restaurants is not, uh, it's not free. You know, there's, there's a cost associated okay. with closing it and reopening it. So yeah. that was part of the the thought process was like, how can we do everything we can to keep our managers employed, prevent, ourselves from closing down because there's a cost associated with the reopening. So we could at least lose that amount of money before making the decision to, you know, uh, close the doors. And so within, you know, three days we had built, uh, our, our core routine of, you know, like three people built six different e-commerce sites. So yeah. we, you know, my goal was we, we can't live off of 30% of 30%, meaning Uber takes 30% of your sales if your sales are down 70%, you right. can't survive on that. Like that's yeah. just not going to work. So left. yeah, there's nothing left. So we basically built these e-commerce sites on the fly and then leveraged our, you know, customer email database, uh, social media following, and really, you know, every possible aspect we could to get the word out there that, Hey, we're still alive. We're still servicing the community. I had my managers take literally the phone list out of open table and start texting our customers one at a time saying, Hey, (laughs) we're open, place a takeout order. And then we, you know, there's, there's two challenges here. There's the demand side, which is how do you get sales in an environment where your dining rooms are closed and how do you make, you know, you know, control your cost. And so we basically try to attack both of those problems as fast as we could. And, on the demand side, it's really about promoting takeout and delivery, driving traffic to the e-commerce sites and things like that, doing food that people want to go. Uh, and, that, and then operationally figuring out how to handle it because we've gotten busy on the takeout side, but it's still brutal from an operations perspective to you know sell this many takeout orders in a one hour period on Fridays when everybody wants to get their takeout at the same time. So that you know has its challenge as well but then on the the cost side we just basically cut out all costs uh down to only the essential so that's number one our people number two our vendors that you know are providing us the food that we need to sell in order to stay in business utilities credit card fees is just a handful of truly essential things um and then everything else we basically told people look we'll you know, we're on hold, you know, and, you know, we talk to landlords and all of our other kind of, you know, um, purveyors and said, Hey, look, work with us and we'll get through this together and we'll figure out a way out of this. But, you know, the only way to figure out a way out is if we keep working and serving the community. And so, um, thankfully, you know, we're three weeks into this and we're still alive. We're still here. All the restaurants are still open. All the managers are employed and, We've got, you know, some of our hourly staff now coming back that, you know, we've uh, kind of reclassified as, you know, service team members so that they can participate in the tips. And, you know, we're all kind of one team now. So it's we've just changed the entire business model basically overnight. So it's been it's been a wild few weeks. Well, and as an outsider and a marketing guy and kind of looking at what you guys did, you know, I talked several weeks ago about all the emails I was receiving from places that I didn't even remember giving them an email address. And all of a sudden they're telling me how they're addressing this. And then I haven't heard from them again. But then you guys, like every single day, I get this email about what's on your menu. What can be done as takeout? What can be made at home? And they're fun. Like, and I don't, and don't take this critically, but there's like so homespun, like they come across and it's like, yeah. it looks like an Atari uh, video game. Some of them do. And I'm like, this is so awesome, right? Cause you guys have done such a great job of pivoting it and turning it into something that's positive. And, you know, I don't even know, they send out these lists of restaurants that, you know, could be open, couldn't be open. I'm not sure. I know your restaurants are open. Mm-hmm. We know 
go there, that you're still doing this. There are others that have said they were at the beginning, but now they've dropped off. And mm -hmm. you guys are doing a great job of kind of staying in front of it. I can't imagine building that many sort of e-commerce engines and having, you know, you got to come up with that content every day and you got to come up with those menus. I mean, that's a lot of working parts on the back end. Yeah. You know, it's uh, on the marketing side, my wife is leading that whole charge. And, you know, when this first started, I was, you know, I said, I was like, we need to send an email every day yeah. to, the, to, to the entire database, you know, and she's like, are you crazy? <laughs> <laughs> She's like, no one's ever, and, and our open rates have been 40%. Yeah. Like, I open them every double. time. Oh, yeah, they double what they normally are because we do have, we have content every day yeah. and there are things that we can talk about and there are things that we're doing and, you know, and, and, and trying to think of unique content, things that we can do to try to engage people in a really challenging time. And, you know, like today is a perfect example. We launched a new restaurant. Uh, I know. I thought that was amazing. Steakhouse. Uh, as a virtual restaurant, out of Cooks and Soldiers. But this honestly was an idea where, you know, we had a friend that told us they couldn't find a steak in Atlanta. And then we looked and we we're like, there are no steakhouses open in Atlanta right now. Right. And we have this awesome wood fire grill, an amazing culinary team, access to incredible ingredients on the, you know, on the beef side, I'm like, and a and a, an entire, you know, database of customers, you know, that are interested in what we're doing. And so we, you know, from idea to launch, literally three days. So we well, built that is that what website, I like. the logo, everything. And, and now it's like ready to rock as of today. Yeah. And that, that is kind of what I like about that. I'm going to tell people I'm a recovering technologist. And so like in the technology world, you can do that. Like you can create something and get it out there. And when you're doing things, typically in the restaurant space, you know, there's months of planning and there's all this, this stuff and to be able to kind of play and experiment and see what's going to kind of live through this. That's a really interesting approach. The, the other thing that you're doing that I want you to touch on is the, uh, the buying the meals for the front line. That's a really yeah. cool concept too. So, talk so about this is another kind of idea um, that came about where we realized that we had these people that need to work and, you know, we're employing them anyway. Um, let's put them to work doing something that could be good for the community. And so uh, we came up with this idea of feed the front lines and we partnered with hospitals and the, the big one that we're partnering with right now is Emory, but we're going to be working with some others, but you know, Emory has three main facilities that we can um, be able to service. And, you know, they have needs on a daily basis for these people that are literally risking their lives every day. Um, you know, and, and uh, it's, a, it's an extremely challenging environment. So if we can offer like a little bit of hospitality and love in that environment right now, I think it's a win. And, you know, a lot of our customers are looking for ways to um, contribute, but there's not a lot of ways for people to contribute. And we, you know, as, as challenging as, it been, as it's been for our company, one of the reasons, one of the things that I've tried to stay is service focused. You know, a lot of, uh, of people seem these days, and, and it's a trying time and you know, I'm not passing judgment on, on any other response to this, but you know, a lot of people have their hand out and, and I, and I understand that response because it is very brutal and, and our industry has been, you know, decimated, but at the end of the day, our goal is to try to be as hospitality focused as possible. So what can we do for others before thinking of ourselves? And so um, this seemed to be a win-win where we're able to, you know, um, engage the community as a way for people to give back. We're able to give back by doubling the donation and we're keeping our staff employed and working on these meals during hours that they're not making takeout for, you know, our paying customers. So yeah. it, it's just a win-win all the way around. Well, and it, and it plays into, you know, people like to give to a specific thing. You know, like that, and that is a very specific thing. Like you're buying this meal, and it's being doubled, and it's going to the front line, and it's got this very specific piece to it. So it's a really interesting, interesting approach. The um, question I have for you around: so you get the orders in, and then pickup. Like, what does pickup look like? Is it crazy? Because some of your restaurants are not in the most; they're in little places, right? Like the yeah. Little Zero is in downtown Decatur, and we were there not that long ago. You've got like the parking lot behind it, and the little thing in the front, like. 
How are you even ma managing well, that? And so now this is, and this is as things have, you know, um, kind of progressed, we're not even letting customers inside the restaurants. So we are setting up tables and pickup locations in specific areas and doing curbside contactless uh, drop off where people are just pulling up to our like little spot we're radioing back in who it is to the restaurant. They're taking the 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 order out, putting it in someone's trunk, securing it, and closing it. So there's never even a contact point um, with the customer. And honestly, that's that's for the safety of our staff. And yeah. so um, as we've continued to operate, we know that the the risk of operating is that we're putting our people out there, and so we have to now think of even more extreme safety measures that we can implement to ensure that we're still able to do this in two weeks, a month, eight weeks, right. however long we're doing this. And that's honestly the biggest threat to our business now is like we've started to figure out how to operate in this new um, environment. But the biggest threat is, is the virus itself now to, to our business. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so talk to me a little bit about that. So, you've got that as a threat. Are there other things that you're trying to work through or think about as you move through this? And you know, what's better than you expect? What may be worse? Like, where where are well, you? Well, I think the the thing that's good now is that there's clarity around how we can operate, and there's clarity around what the consumer can do. So. You know, even even recently with the the whole stay at home order issued by Fulton County and threatening jail and all this other stuff, you know, that creates a whole nother level of uncertainty. Like people are like, can I go and pick up takeout? Is that an essential thing? I mean, am I allowed to do that anymore? And so, I, at this point, we just want all of the restrictions as possible, right. and say, okay, right. this is how you operate. These are the rules. Let's let's not. Uh, be amb ambiguous about this. And let's just say, this is what you're able to do. So now that we're finally in that place, I feel like where there's some consistency statewide as to what we're able to do. Now people know that, you know, hey, I can go pick up takeout and I can do these things. And we know we can operate in this way and uh, protect our staff and do those things. So um, just even having some clarity around that is huge because in the early days, I mean, we're just reacting to everything and hopefully trying to get a little bit ahead of it. But I mean, it was happening so fast that there's just no way. Well, and you and I both know as business leaders that people say they want freedom and ambiguity and all that. They do not. They want rules. They want to know where the boundaries are. Like, what can I do and not do? Because then you can live within it because they're going to break the rules within them, right? Like, what is it that I can do that kind of still fits? But make sure that it's not something that's going to you know continue to jeopardize the business. So. Um, so talk to me, so the things that you're providing, so I've seen, you know, you've got, it looks like cooked, but you're also doing kits too, right? Yes. You yeah. So we started out initially with family meals, meals that were really designed well to travel, uh, feed two to four, you know, kind of a re more reasonable price point than you'd expect from a fine dining restaurant. Mm -hmm. That really took off well. So we, were, we were happy with the results there. And then the next step was really to say, okay, you know, if people delivery costs or, you know, going to pick up a meal is, is a friction point. So how can we kind of pair that where you buy a meal for tonight and then you buy a meal kit for, let's say, tomorrow to make at, at the house? And, you know, we recognize that people don't really know how to cook. And so our <laughs> meal kits are more like we've done most of the work for you. We've done like 85 percent of the work. And we're just going to give you that last 15% so you feel like you're cooking, but you're not right. actually yeah. cooking. But it's yeah. going to come out fresh. The cake batter where you get to the eggs, right? Like they, yeah. they, the, when cake batters first came out, you didn't That's have right. it. And people didn't feel like they were cooking. So now you yeah. have to have to so, it, so the So that exact example is the one that I gave to all of our chefs. I was like, remember talking about the cake batter? We talk about it in leadership training, how, you know, it's, it's not your cake unless you actually combine the eggs and the milk. Uh, <laughs> so... We we had that you know discussion internally, so I was like, "Look, chefs, like this, is, we got to give them a little bit of work to do, um, but we don't want them, you know, doing all of the work, and we want it to be delicious and hot and fresh. And so, how can we achieve that? So, uh, those are you know, we launched Double Zero meal kits this week. Next week will be Iberian Pig. Uh, the week uh, and then towards the end of the week, probably Cooks and Soldiers. But yeah, we're we're starting to roll the the meal kits out too, as as just a fun, uh, you know. 
alternative to take out or, you know, buying stuff from the supermarket. Yeah. And it, and it scratches that itch. We're used to going out to restaurants two or three times a week. So this is driving me crazy. That's always my Friday and Saturday night thing. Right. So, yep. uh, you know, it's like, and we need to, you know, so at least scratch that itch. So as you, so people who want to sign up to find out, so do they go to, go to just the individual restaurant websites? Cause I'm, I'm on your list. So I'm getting, yeah. like, so you, uh, the best place to find all the information is churestaurants.com. Uh, you know, Castellucci hospitality group. Uh, and, and there we'll have, we'll have all the brands and then you can see kind of what we're doing and, um, you know, kind of engage with the various brands, sign up for the email, et cetera. And also, and then also social media, you guys are on social media. Yeah. So all the brands are on social media, have all their own handles. So the names of the restaurants are the handles and, you know, we have a good following there. So we're, we're constantly putting content out on social as well to kind of support what we're doing elsewhere. Yeah, I mean, you've got such a great story and so many small businesses and you know, restaurants and others can look to some of the ideas you guys have done to pivot in this time. I mean, it's been it's been pretty amazing. I love Thank you. I appreciate I it. Because I'm a business guy at heart. So watching people kind of go through these periods of time and figure out and the only this is one of those things we can only make it through. Right there, you got to get through it. So how do you get through it and stand on the other side? Yeah, and you've figured out some models. Is there anything the public or anybody else can do for you all as you try to put this together? Uh, you know, honestly, at the end of the day, the the best thing that you can do is just place a takeout order, maybe add a uh, a you know a feed the front lines uh, you know meal onto that order, and you know keeps our people working, and it does a good thing in the process, and. Really, that's that's what we focused on since day one. You know, we want to figure out ways that we can serve um, and not, you know, just uh, ask for your, you know, uh, patronage. You know, just you know, figure out ways that we can actually deliver products and services to the community uh, and you know, improve improve people's lives just a little bit. So that's the goal. Well, I appreciate you taking some time out of what I know is a really crazy, busy period, and I was thrilled that you agreed to talk with us. So. Uh, We've been talking with Fred Costalucci with Costalucci Group, chgroup.com. Is that the CHG right? Restaurants. CHG Restaurants.com. Yep. Make sure you go visit them there. You've been listening to The Jungle brought to you by Liger Partners. I'm Eric Holtzclaw, and until next time.